There has been a ton of hype about vitamin D in recent years. Supporters say that it's a cure-all, boosting everything from your heart health to your lifespan. But is it really the magic bullet that we've been sold? Well, a top scientific group just flipped the script on what we thought we knew. So what went wrong? Well, we'll break down the latest research, some key cautions, and unpack the new recommendations for vitamin D supplements. Vitamin D was discovered in the early 1900s by researchers who were working out how to cure rickets. This was a common bone disease found in children. They found that vitamin D plays an essential role in forming and maintaining healthy bones. But gradually, our understanding of vitamin D's role grew. It isn't just important for bone health. It's also a key regulator of processes related to immune function, muscles, cell growth, and how we process glucose. Most of the tissues in our body react to vitamin D in some way, and this naturally led to an interest in seeing how vitamin D might be related to diseases beyond just rickets. And once we started looking, we found associations everywhere. The early evidence appeared in observational studies. This is a kind of study that involves watching people in the real world to see how particular metrics, like blood levels of vitamin D, correlate with health outcomes. The results showed an association between low vitamin D and cancer, infectious diseases, autoimmune conditions, diabetes, and heart disease. And what's more, researchers were sounding the alarm that a huge number of people were deficient in this key vitamin. An article in 2006 summed up the evidence. More than a third of healthy young adults had low vitamin D levels, and for those seeking medical care, the number jumps to a whopping 57%. A much more recent study claims around 40% of Europeans are deficient. So what's going on here? Why is there so much deficiency? Well, there's a simple narrative that makes sense of the data. Vitamin D deficiency is a problem of the modern world. When we used to work out in fields all day, it wasn't an issue. That's because our bodies create vitamin D when our skin is exposed to sunlight. But now that we spend most of our time indoors, vitamin D levels suffer. The issue seemed to be serious enough that some even used the word pandemic to describe the problem of vitamin D deficiency. One group of experts commented on the problem in 2016. They wrote that vitamin D deficiency in Europe was concerning and they called for action. So in that context, a prestigious international organization, the Endocrine Society, published guidelines around vitamin D. Those guidelines included three important points. First, they established optimal levels for vitamin D in the blood. They defined deficiency as below 20 nanograms per mil. Insufficiency, which is a milder lack, was defined as below 30. Second, they made a suggestion about supplementation. Adults up to 50 years of age should generally get at least 600 international units of vitamin D a day. Above 70, they counsel upping that to 800, but they note that more might be helpful and to hit a target of 30 nanograms per mil, and to make sure that blood levels are above 30 nanograms per mil, adults might need to get 2,000 international units of vitamin D a day. Finally, they advocated for more testing of vitamin D levels. So in that guideline, who did they suggest should be tested? Well, they thought that we should be testing anyone who's at risk for deficiency. And that makes total sense. But who was at risk? Well, it turns out to be a massive group. They note somewhere between 20 and 100% of elderly are likely deficient in vitamin D. Children are also at high risk, so are young and middle-aged adults, so the at-risk population includes just about all of us. But in fairness, that initial guideline did specifically call for screening in a much narrower range of cases, but the logic of their position implies a potential benefit for a broad range of testing. And those initial recommendations had a profound impact. An assessment in the US found that vitamin D supplementation use jumped from 5% to 19% between 99 and 2012. Vitamin D supplement use has continued to grow year after year, and there's been plenty of influencers who have picked up on this theme, adding to the popularity of vitamin D supplements. Today we're going to talk about why an average person should be taking 10,000 IUs of vitamin D3 as a maintenance dosage every single day. But there's just one problem. Most of this popular picture about vitamin D now looks to be wrong. The Endocrine Society itself has made some major revisions, so let me explain what happened. First, let's talk about the correlation between low vitamin D and health problems like cancer. So initially, it was thought that vitamin D levels was playing a crucial role here, that it would mean that supplementing to maintain healthy vitamin D levels could help avoid these problems. But that raises a key issue with observational studies. Correlation is not the same thing as causation. So for example, everyone knows that gray hair is associated with getting older, but that doesn't mean that gray hair is causing aging. We're not going to stay youthful if we just start dyeing out our hair. 
So here's the problem with vitamin D. Does sufficiency cause all of these health problems, or does it merely correlate with these health problems? So for example, older adults who live in rest homes spend the majority of their time inside, and as a result, they will have low vitamin D. On the other hand, healthier older adults who don't need to be in a rest home spend more time outside, so their vitamin D levels will be higher. So in this scenario, low vitamin D levels will correlate with poor health, but it won't be causing it. This is why we always need to test ideas generated by observational studies with controlled trials. And that's exactly what researchers have been doing with vitamin D. So what have they discovered? Well, one area of investigation has been heart health. The large vital trial looked at the effects of daily vitamin D supplementation over five years in a group of over 25,000 older adults. Now, during the follow-up, they recorded how many heart attacks there were, and their conclusion? Vitamin D supplements did not reduce the rates of heart attacks. They also didn't bring down cancer rates, which has been another area of interest. And a study published just this month backed up the finding about cancer. It was based on a trial of over 20,000 adults who took vitamin D supplements for up to five years. Researchers found that cancer rates of vitamin D were the same as the control group. Then there's mental health. Some research has linked low vitamin D levels with mood disorders and cognitive decline. Depression has been a popular area of interest. The results here are mixed. On one hand, a meta-analysis found that vitamin D supplements improved symptoms for those with clinical indications of depression, but it didn't help improve the mood of those without clinically significant symptoms. But this raises an interesting question. Could taking vitamin D supplements prevent depression in the first place? Well, a large study a few years later set out to answer that question. They looked at about 18,000 older adults and monitored their mood over five years. They discovered that the risk of developing clinically significant depressive symptoms wasn't lower for those taking vitamin D. It didn't improve their mood. Finally, let's look at all-cause mortality. This gives us a broader measure of the impact of vitamin D supplements on health. Now, a large Cochrane review of 56 trials in 2014 gave us initial reason for excitement. They found a small but statistically significant decrease in all-cause mortality with vitamin D supplementation. The risk of death was about 3% lower, but more recent evidence from larger-scale trials paints a different picture. So a meta-analysis completed in 2020 found that vitamin D supplementation may made no difference when it came to all-cause mortality. These studies and others like them cast serious doubt about the idea that we all need to be supplementing with large doses of vitamin D to improve our health. They also cast doubt on the idea that there's a pandemic of deficiency, but we'll return to that in a moment. So a population-wide rush to supplement is wrong-headed, but there are specific groups where vitamin D supplements can help. These are reflected in the new guidelines from the Endocrine Society. The first group is kids. Their main concern here is rickets. But there's also evidence that adequate vitamin D levels can help ward off respiratory infections. So kids up to 18 should get about 1,500 international units daily. The second group is an extremely important one. Supplementation during pregnancy can lower the risk of preeclampsia and preterm birth. It can even improve newborn health. So we're talking about doses of around 3,000 international units a day. Pregnancy is a time when the body is under extra stress and ensuring enough vitamin D can help with a variety of issues. So for example, preeclampsia is a condition that causes high blood pressure and can lead to serious complications for both mother and baby, and it's been linked to low vitamin D levels. So by supplementing, we can potentially reduce the risk of these kinds of complications. The third group is those at high risk of progressing to diabetes. So vitamin D can play a preventative role here. Prediabetes is a condition where blood sugar levels are higher than normal, but not yet high enough to be classified as a diabetic. So for people in this group, lifestyle changes are critical, but adding vitamin D supplements might give that little bit extra help in delaying or preventing the progression to full-blown diabetes. The fourth group is adults over 75 years and older. So as we age, the risk of death appears to decrease with vitamin D supplementation. But why does age matter so much? Well, as we get older, our skin becomes less efficient at producing vitamin D from sunlight. Our kidneys, which also play a role in converting vitamin D to its active form, also start to slow down. So this is why the guidelines specifically call out older adults as a group that may benefit from vitamin D supplements. It's about maintaining bone health, muscle function, and overall resilience as we age. 
But what about those of us who are not in these groups? Shouldn't we be aiming for optimum levels of vitamin D also? Well, here's where one of the most significant revisions in the Endocrine Society guidelines have occurred. In their updated recommendations, they acknowledge that we've got a big problem. We don't exactly know what the optimal levels of vitamin D are. This has led them to abandon the earlier thresholds that they set for insufficiency and deficiency. They also advise against routine screening for vitamin D levels. Basically, there's no point in doing vitamin D blood tests if we don't know which range we should be targeting. And if we think about all of the study evidence that we've looked at so far, we can draw some tentative conclusions. We know from studies on depression, all-cause mortality and rickets, that people who are low in vitamin D definitely seem to be getting a benefit from supplementing. At the same time, studies that looked at vitamin D supplementation in the general population haven't found benefits, so those two pieces of evidence together suggest that most people are getting adequate levels of vitamin D. Now of course we always need more research, but at the moment it seems that the evidence doesn't support the idea that there's a huge proportion of the population who are suffering from low levels of vitamin D. In fact the evidence points to a potential risk in the opposite direction, especially with the recent enthusiasm for high dose vitamin D supplements, there's a chance that we can be getting too much. A three year clinical trial in Canada for example, tested the impact of several daily doses of vitamin D. One group took 400 international units, another took 4,000, and a third group took 10,000. Researchers were looking specifically at how this affected bone density. What they found was shocking. The higher dose groups didn't improve outcomes. In fact, it seemed to make things worse. Bone density in the wrist decreased by 2.4% in the 4,000 international unit group and 3.5% in the 10,000 international unit group. This is related to a known risk with excessive vitamin D, hypercalcemia. So this is where the level of calcium in the blood is too high. And this can happen because vitamin D regulates calcium in the body. So we need adequate amounts for healthy bones, but too much can throw things out of balance. We can even start to pull calcium out of our bones, which is what that trial looked at demonstrates. And emerging evidence suggests that there are additional risks with older adults that we need to be aware of. So too high a dose of vitamin D may actually weaken muscles. So in one study of women with low vitamin D, the intervention group took 2,800 international units of vitamin D daily for three months. In the end, their hand grip strength fell by 9% and their leg strength by 13%. And it can also increase the risk of falls. One key study focused on women and divided them into groups at different levels of daily supplementation, ranging from 400 to 4,800 international units, plus a placebo group. Now, researchers recorded their number of falls after one year, and there was an interesting U-shaped association curve. So vitamin D seemed to help, but at very high doses, it didn't. So in those getting 1,600 international units, fell the least. But when it came to women with a previous history of falls, the high doses actually seemed to increase their rate of falls. Another study found a similar result. The highest doses of vitamin D were associated with an increased risk of falling. So when it comes to vitamin D supplements, more is definitely not always better. So where does that leave us now? Should we be taking it? Well, I've already talked about four particular groups and the recommended doses, but what about for the rest of us? Well, the latest Endocrine Society guidelines suggest following the recommended daily intake of 600 international units for younger adults and increasing that to 800 international units as you hit 50 and above. That dose is less than the previous Endocrine Society guideline that we noted earlier, and I do want to emphasize that point. After a further 13 years of data collection and human trials, the Endocrine Society is recommending less vitamin D compared to their previous guideline. Now all of this is very different compared to what you'll hear other health influencers say who are promoting supplementation with much higher doses, often without any testing or clear indication of deficiency. But according to the best data that we currently have, this is where we are. The 600 to 800 international unit dose for the general population ensures that people aren't deficient in vitamin D and locks in the known benefits. This is why in microvitamin, I reduced the vitamin D dose from 2,000 international units to 1,000. But just because I take a supplement does not in any way mean that you should as well. But even if vitamin D has been overhyped, that doesn't mean it isn't important. And this raises a critical point about supplements in general. Now you hear all kinds of claims about them that don't hold up to scrutiny, but there are nine supplements with strong evidence for effectiveness. So make sure to check out this next video here to see if the ones that you are currently taking are on the list.